Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have David Deutsch, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. A little bit about David. He's written and sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of his clients' products, which include everything from books and seminars to Maxwell House Coffee and American Express cards. David works with some of the largest publishers of books and newsletters, such as Boardroom Inc., Healthy Directions, Agora, Soundview, and many more. David, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Very excited. And I always like to include a fun fact. You know, we're going to learn about, you know, from one of the masters of copywriting, what worked, what didn't work, some of the, you know, big mistakes, the journey. I always like to include a fun fact. And you were telling me about your friend, Bill Royal, and what he says. Uh, what does he say? And then how does that relate to you? Well, it's telling you a little bit about Bill used to have these dinners and one of the things he would do to keep people entertained, he'd go around the table and say, everybody collect something. What do you collect? And it was people you would never expect where they collected, you know, little uh, elephant dolls, little elephant right. trinkets. They had uh, thousands of little elephant things or whatever. And I, you know, when I thought I said, I don't really collect anything, but then I realized I really collect, you could see behind me, I really collect books. Mm. I really, I've got about 2000 books on bookshelves that are groaning. I've got 500 books on my Kindle or so. I haven't read them all, but I've, of course, but I've, I've read parts of them and I, I like knowing that they're here if I, if I need something from them. So, so what are some of your favorites? Oh gosh, you know, um, there are certain uh, historical fiction books that I love. Um, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, Herman Wouk. For one, and uh, you know the war of war and remembrance, uh, and all you know, of course, books on advertising, yeah. marketing, so what are your favorite advertising, marketing, copywriting books besides your oh, own? Of God. course, that's the boring stuff. You know, is the copywriting and advertising <laughs> stuff. Um, but you know, David Ogilvy, who I used to work for when mm -hmm. I was at Ogilvy and Mather, mm -hmm. you know, his books are just so entertainingly written. He's just got this witty, charming way about him. Gene Schwartz's. Uh, uh, Breakthrough advertising is just such a – everything you need to know in a way about copywriting is in that book. You just read it over and over again. Yeah. And I've got, about, um, I've got about seven copies of it because really? uh, Brian Kurtz at Boardroom always likes to give them away at events and other people events. He's there with them and I always, you know, I always get the gift bag and in the gift bag is a copy of it, so – if anyone needs a copy, just you know, meet me at a seminar, and I'll I'll give you mine. Well, I'm gonna see you. I'm gonna see you at a seminar, so I expect a copy. That oh, I'm sure it'll be in your gift bag from Brian at the at the Titan seminar. And, David, uh, um, what's your process for writing a book? Because you have two books: Million Dollar Marketing Secrets and Think Inside the Box. Right, right. So, what's your process for sitting down and writing? Is that um, a a long process for you? What does it look like? You know, books are in a way so much easier than copywriting. Copywriting, you have to write something that's got to get someone to dip into his wallet and sell and and buy your product and give you money. Mm -hmm. You're maybe you're competing against other great copywriters that have the control. Uh, writing a book is kind of nice. You just have to say whatever you want to and fill up the pages. It's no one's going to. It's not going to be tested to within one tenth of a percentage point it's not going to succeed or fail in the mar in the you know in the mail or online so I, I find it relaxing by comparison to hmm. write a book and I just you know when I've written books I've just written about whatever I wanted but marketing for the first one and creativity which is a, a near and dear subject to my heart for the second one what's your favorite story from the million dollar marketing secrets Oh gosh, you would ask me that. That's from such a long time ago. I don't remember very much of it, except that you know, except that I wrote it and probably. It all comes natural to you now. And it all it all comes natural to me now. Just I just remember that I wrote it and barely remember what's in it. So some of the marketing greats, David, I was reading, have said some very kind words about you. Um, that I was reading on your site, and I wanted to know one campaign you remember working on uh, for them and why it works so well. And one, Jay Abraham said, if you can afford the big guns, I'd encourage you to call David Deutsch. He writes killer copy, goes on to talk about, you know, winner, you know, control pieces, mailing out millions. 
what was one of the successful pieces you remember uh, that you worked with Jay on? Oh, gosh. You know, Jay and I worked on some, you know, Jay is, oh, it's hard to say with Jake. He's always evolving in his process of what he's selling. And what he's selling is always kind of, in a way, a very, he's selling kind of all his products at once in a certain way. And we worked on a seminar that he was thinking of, that he was going to do. And I'm not sure that seminar ever came to fruition, to be honest with you. But that's, that's Jay. He's got a million ideas that he's developing. And, you know, he and I worked together for a week out at his office in California, which I treasure not just for getting paid for working with him for a week, but just the experience of being in Jay's office and getting to hang out with him for a week. I just learned so much by osmosis in terms of how he works, how he writes, how he thinks. So yeah. that, that was really the value there. But I can't point to a piece and say, oh, that, that piece you've seen, that's my piece that I wrote. You know? So what did you learn being in his office and kind of seeing how he works? You know, th I learned that Jay really works by asking questions. Jay just asks really good questions, and that enables him to have a system where he elicits the information he needs to do things. And he asks himself questions too. How can I increase the number of sales this company makes? How can I increase the amount that is made on each transaction? How can I do this? Are there any outside relationships I can take advantage of that can get them sales? Any endorsed, any endorsements that can be done? Then the, the other thing I, I learned from Jay really is the mindset he gets into is a very caring about the customer, putting himself in the customer's shoes. How can I serve this customer? So that when you read his copy, you feel like you're cared for and you feel like you're, you're in good hands. Yeah, yeah. That is important. And um, I know we'll talk about that a little bit later when it comes to research. Um, another person who said kind words, Brian Kurtz who's having his Titans event. Uh, he said, David Deutsch is one of only a handful of A-plus copywriters in the country. He goes on about it. Is there a particular piece or something you learned from Brian in Boardroom? Oh, gosh, I've learned so much. I mean, you'll see at the Titans event how much can be learned from Boardroom. But just, you know, the, the main thing is just how to take information, how to take good information, information that people really need to know and make it so they're interested in it. Make it so they really want to know it, that it's fun for them, that it's entertaining for them, that their curiosity is piked. And so one of the first things I did for Boardroom was a book on estate planning. And thank goodness it was too, because there's nothing more boring than estate planning. <laughs> yeah, what is, how do you people, make that exciting? I, people don't even want to know about estate planning. They don't even want to think about estate planning. And you make it exciting by taking something like, in a will, you must list the beneficiaries in antecedent order, you know, by amount of benefit, benefit uh, according to state statute number 287, or there is a chance that the beneficiaries may not be eligible for the receipts of the estate upon disbursement. And, you know, that basically means you got to do this or else you, the people may not, not inherit valid. what you wanted to inherit. So you turn that into a bullet, which is something like how to accidentally disinherit your heirs or how to keep from accidentally disinheriting your heirs. Right. So, of course, people want to know that. What do you mean I could accidentally disinherit my heirs? How, how could I do that? So estate planning becomes a little bit interesting and a little bit exciting and a little bit fun. So you have to become an expert on pretty much anything that you are writing copy for. Yes, and that's one of the things I love about writing copy is, okay, today I'm learning about weight loss and how people feel about weight loss. Yesterday I learned about this factory that makes O-rings and, you know, tomorrow I'll learn about, you know, something about investing. So what's been, David, something that you had never thought you'd be interested in, but because you had to really study it through the cop, you know, writing copy, you ended up being quite interested in it? Oh, gosh. Um, you ask very hard questions. 
<laughs> That's what they pay me for. You know, I suppose investing is something I never really thought I would be very interested in. Mm -hmm. And now that I think about that and uh, from working with clients, uh, I, I find that it's actually very fun to learn about investing and to get the the feedback of investing in something and checking oh has it gone up today oh look i i made not only is it exciting to see it went up but you make money when it goes up and learning about the psychology of the market and trying to outsike the market by investing in the right things at the right time learning about options i i love math and options are such are so purely mathematical and so interesting on that level too. So I, I would say, yeah, just the, the, the nuances of investing. Yeah. I saw too, and um, that David Ogilvy has a quote on your site, and he, he said, you write well. Do you know mm -hmm. what, uh, what was he referring to? Um, he was referring to, actually was referring to my book. Oh. Um, I had sent him a copy of the book, and uh, he had, you know, he had, I was trying to get him to do a preface or something like that, you know, when he said in his Ogilvian way, I am so, you know, overwhelmed by so many people wanting me to do prefaces and blah, 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 but you, but you, but you do write well, and I'm very sorry, and blah, blah, blah. So, of course, you know, just I learned from the people that do the movie trailers and the movie promotions where if you've got a good quote, no matter how buried it is, right. You know, uh, even if it's the last paragraph, you take it out and you put it in lights and it says, you know, brilliant. Even if the quote was from the lights in this movie are a little bit too brilliant for my taste. <laughs> right. But I nevertheless <laughs> didn't like the movie very much. So you take brilliant and put it up there like that. This is the right context. But so they want to go back. You said I asked hard questions. These will be all answers, you know, and love. I want to hear about when you were growing up what uh, big influence uh, for you was? What shaped you early on? Hmm. You know, I guess um, I had two influences, really. My father was very smart and very intellectual, and I really got a love of learning from him and a love of just, just curiosity, which is so essential for copywriting. Mm-hmm. And what did he do? He was a psychotherapist. Okay. Yeah, so you have to have a curiosity if you're a psychotherapist. You you do. And he was a psychotherapist. And it's also very interestingly, he was interested in linguistics and got an article published in Etc. magazine, which I only found out, you know, kind of later in life that 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 he had done this. And it was about oh gosh, it was so over my head about the linguistic implications of how we think about things and um, and so, but, you know, he was always curious and he was always exploring things and wanting to do things and wanting to try new things, new restaurants, new this, new that, go places. And my mother kind of provided the more you know, empathetic. She was very caring, very emotional, very loving of people. And, uh, what little of that I have, um, <laughs> you know, I got... <laughs> Thank goodness I got, you know, I got from her because she was just so loving and kind to everyone. And that, that was a great counterbalance to my father's intellectual, you know, objective kind of way of looking at life. So so what did the early days of your career look like? What did you do? Gosh, you know, I really got into advertising by accident. I really have to confess. Um, I had no intention of getting into advertising. I, I, I was between teaching jobs. I got a, I, I, I am a great typist. I was then. I have people used to walk by my dorm room and hear me typing and they go, what is that? You know, <laughs> you're not really typing real words, are you? So when I was between teaching jobs, I got a, a temporary job. Uh, and they said, oh, we've got a temporary job for you at this agency. Uh, it's an advertising agency. Eh, well, sure, whatever. You know, that, that sounds like it might be interesting. And so I started working at Ogilvy and Mather and doing typing. And I said, well, I can write this stuff, you know, give me something to write. And so I started writing and became a copywriter at Ogilvy and Mather. And later found out that if you want to get started in advertising, Ogilvy and Mather would be the place you would <laughs> want to get started in advertising. That would be because it's such a teaching, you know, Ogilvy is such a teacher and it was such a teaching environment to work there. So uh, I, I 
locked into that. What kind of stuff are you working on? At Ogilvy, I was doing a lot of a lot of different things. I was doing a lot of some advertising, some you know brochures, promotional work. The department I was in did a guidebook to Bermuda, of all things, because the head of the department had some connections there. We did um, we did a lot of multimedia stuff at a time when multimedia was you know not what it is now, where anyone could do multimedia on a computer and you know right. This was back when you actually had to go out and film things and put slides together and. Do all that much more cumbersome yeah 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 so so what kind of learning did you do you said it was a very teaching uh teaching environment well you know ogilvy has his rules of what advertising should be how to address this consumer is not a moron she's your wife um you should never use reverse type on this but but also just a way of thinking about advertising as accountable. I, I was so lucky to have started there where, you know, Ogilvy wasn't concerned about winning awards. He was concerned about what worked, what mm-hmm. moved the sales needle. Right. And, you know, he used to say my, my first love is, was direct mail. You know, he loved that accountability and he incorporated it into what he did in, in quote, brand advertising. Mm-hmm. Um, he turned me on to people like... Uh, Capels to people like um, Claude Hopkins. You know, that was a signed reading when you were at Ogilvy. Yeah. I mean, who gets that? There's certainly at no other agency. Great education, say, yeah. You have to go read Claude Hopkins. That's I'm a great not sure edu- that's even a signed reading at a lot of direct mail agencies. <laughs> so what, um, what did you see that did work at that time? Because you're, you're just kind of, you know, you were a teacher and then you kind of hopped into this career what were you seeing that was working well? What, what, what do you mean when you say... Like, um, I guess the campaigns you were working on or when you were writing things, you said they were very measured with for the results. Well, certainly the things Ogilvy did. Um, you know, I worked on parts of campaigns for things like Maxwell House Coffee or American Express and things like that. And, you know, you could see the effect of the the advertising in terms of the increasing of sales of the American Express cards or Maxwell House coffee or things like that. You know, we track those things very carefully and say, oh, you know, sales moved up here. Nobody took, people didn't talk so much about brand awareness and are are we, you know, positioning the brand in the proper way. We were like, oh, sales go up this week. Okay, they did. Good. You know. I'm just curious of what, like visually, what elements were in there that allowed it to actually sell because I'm sure a lot of those companies you know now even today just worry about brand awareness they're not like right. selling anything what did you include or what did the team include in there so that you actually get a response that worked well it included the the classic things that we know about reason why advertising explaining how things work uh, explaining the reasons why why things should be done rather than rather than pretty you know the classic Rolls Royce ad uh, that Ogilvy did at 60 miles an hour the loudest noise in this new Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock and then it had 17 reasons why you should buy mm-hmm. a Rolls Royce it wasn't just a picture of a Rolls Royce with a beautiful woman and this will be the luxury experience you've been dreaming of all your life right. Everything was very giving good, rational reasons within an emotional context. Yeah. And that's so important. Like we were talking about with my mother and my father, you know, you've got you've to have both. You've got to have the emotional pull of the Rolls-Royce brand and what that means. And at the same time, you've got to talk to the intellectual part that says, right. why should I pay $100,000 for a hunk of machinery? Yeah. So when did you decide to venture out on your own? Well, um, again, that was that was Jay Abraham's doing. Uh, I worked at different. I worked at Ogilvy. I worked at other ad agencies. I loved to do a variety of different things. I loved to go out and get new business. I loved to do the account work. Um, I I kind of a certain way. I kind of avoided writing because that was like work. But going out and working with the client and finding new business and doing media planning, that was all, that was all great fun. Uh, but I did occasionally write. And I worked at a lot of different agencies in, in New York and in Richmond. 
And then one day I was reading Success Magazine. It was this big full-page ad by this crazy Jay Abraham guy about, you know, uh, what was he doing then about um, your marketing genius at work? Uh, and it was a whole two-page thing about this uh, this program that cost, I think it was uh, $500, which was a lot of money at that time and certainly a lot of money for me at that time. And uh, that darned if he didn't get me to write a check for $500. And and I, reading this stuff was just so eye-opening and so exciting. I I, I wanted to be like a, a Jay Abraham. And then he actually had a program. We could, sort of could be like a junior Jay Abraham. He had something called a protege program. And I got the home study version. That, that was $5,000. So he got me from $500 to $5,000. And that was a huge box full of of stuff. And uh, I, I said, okay, I want to do this. I want to go, I want to be in a more accountable environment. I want to make deals like Jay, where I get 25 cents out of every increased dollar. And I, I quit the ad agency and went out on my own and never quite got to the working for 25 cents on the dollar of increased profit thing, because I very quickly started writing copy and found that people would cut me checks right away to write copy, whereas getting a check for 25 cents on every dollar of increased profit would take quite a while before people would start cutting me checks. And uh, so I hooked up with a guy named John Finn, who was a copywriter's agent in uh, Los Angeles. And he connected me with people like, uh, like Jim Rutz and different clients that I worked with. And before I knew it, I was well known in the copywriting industry. And of course, Jim Rutz worked for Boardroom, and so I worked with Jim for Boardroom, and then eventually worked with Boardroom on my own. So, what were some of the first memorable <laughs> campaigns or companies you worked for? It sounds like you did a lot of work for Boardroom early on. Mm -hmm. What? Who else did you uh, end up um, working with? Oh gosh, I, I worked for a company called. Uh, I can't even remember, a verbal advantage. And I think they're still around and they have a product which is to increase your vocabulary to their, the premise being that you will be smarter and appear smarter if you know more words, which is to a large extent true. Shakespeare had a vocabulary of like about 50,000 words wow. to the average person's 10,000. Wow. And so that doesn't just mean you can use harder words, but it means you're more familiar with words. You have more to draw on. And so I did a promotion for that. And that was fascinating to learn about how people relate to being successful, to how a program like that can help them. Yeah. Were there any tough times early on? It sounded like the, the agent really helped things. You know, I would imagine when you're starting off on your own, it's not the easiest. You know, I would say, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed not to have some hard luck stories of, yeah, I struggled. And then one day I found, you know, that the key was this. If, if you, um, I think in the beginning, I was probably making a little less money than I really should have been making for the amount of money that I was spending. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just looked at from a sheer financial, good financial management sort of point of view. Uh, so it did take a little while to get started, to get the the money, just to find what I wanted. And, you know, as I said, I was kind of trying to be a junior J. Abraham and what I really needed to be doing was writing copy and eventually that's what I started doing. So It seemed like the getting clients part you really enjoyed though. The writing copy yeah, early I enjoyed on. that a little more in advertising. Oh, I gotcha. You know, because that was like, you know, a creative shootout. Four agencies are pitching this account, and we've got to come up with a winning concept to do it. I, it getting client, I've never really had a problem getting clients. Uh, after working with Jim Rutz, people wanted to work with me because they knew I had worked with Jim. Mm. I had worked with Boardroom, so I had that, that experience was always great. Oh, you've worked with Boardroom. That's, you know, um, that's very impressive. You've worked at Ogilvy. That's very impressive. Yeah. So with um, a lot of the companies you're working for, what are some of the memorable, successful campaigns and why they were effective? 
Because you have the controls on a lot of, of things. I, I do, and I have. I mean, controls yeah. kind of come and go. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the ones I'm proud of, uh, I'll give you a non-boardroom story because I've got so many boardroom stories I'll, I'll bore you with as we go along. Not the word, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. One of the, the, an interesting one was for a company called Soundview, and they had a, a product called the Second Opinion uh, by, by Dr. Rowan. And, you know, he's a brilliant uh, alternative doctor, uh, discovered, uh, not discovered so much, but found a lot of incredible natural cures, um, worked with them on his patients, finds what works, what doesn't. And the challenge was, of course, how do you present that in a way that that is different from everyone else out there that's claiming forbidden cures and this doctor really knows his stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea that I came up with for that that was very successful was um, how to cure any disease by finding its hidden weakness. Hmm. And this idea of every idea having a hidden weakness, there was a, a picture of a chain link, uh, a, a chain, uh, yeah, a chain, and it was broken at one link. And the idea being that, and, and when I really looked at his cures, a lot of them were every disease really did have a hidden weakness, like cancer, for instance, loves sugar. If you can keep cancer from getting the sugar it needs, you can destroy cancer. And a lot of other diseases, similarly, when you look at the alternative cures, they were really just this very clever way of almost tricking this disease into destroying itself mm. or into not existing or creating an environment where it couldn't exist based, based on a hidden weakness. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it was a great idea and it was, you know, it was a challenge to pull off because you had to look at all his cures and say, okay, which ones really exemplify this? So that was, that was a nice control for... How did you come to that? Because that's not, it's not like you just thought of this overnight. What was your process for getting to that? Okay, I need this chain. I need, you know, the hidden weakness. You know, I have a theory of creative. I have two theories of creativity. One is, and, and this is what my, my book, the book is really yeah. based on. Yeah. You, that you ask yourself enough questions. You, um, you say, like, how can I do the opposite? How can I reverse this? How can I divide it up? How can I do this kind of a headline? How can I do this kind of a concept? Uh, if you reverse engineer a lot of great ideas, you can see what the mechanism is that they came from. Yeah. Arthur Johnson's had enough campaign for one of the alternative newsletters. Had enough of them telling you not to eat this, not to eat this, to eat tofu and to drink water. Had enough of that? Well, well my guy tells you drink coffee if you want because coffee cures high blood pressure. Do this, do that. Right. And that's simply an opposite kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. so one theory is you ask yourself the right questions and you, you keep trying different templates, seeing what works and what doesn't, and you do it like that. And the other is, which is more how this idea came about, is you learn as much as you can, you put as much stuff in, you work with it, you try to come up with things, and then you just kind of sit quietly and let your subconscious take over and see what bubbles up. And yeah. one day I did that, and what bubbles up with, you know, hidden, the idea of hidden weakness, yeah. cure any disease. And I don't know where that comes from, but yeah. I know that's how the subconscious works. It's, yeah. it's always going in there. It's always going on in there. Yeah, yeah. I read that in one of your blog posts, and actually that hit home for me because I don't do enough of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, it's hard for me to just sit quietly and and ruminate and that's probably the one thing I should be doing to kind of just let the creativity come right. out. Because you probably know about brain waves and different types of brain waves and which ones are more conducive to a meditative state or a creative state where things like that can, can bubble yeah. up. Yeah. But too, but I don't do I don't do as much of that as I should either, nearly. So what about a fun, a good boardroom? You said you have a lot of boardroom stories, successful campaigns. What's a good boardroom one? Oh gosh, you know there was a campaign for Gary Null. Which I could listen to your successful campaigns all day, by the way. So just oh, keep, well, keep them coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, was working on something for Gary Null, who was likewise an alternative guy. He's not a doctor per se, 
but he's very well known nutritionist and has writes about cures very prolific writer and this was his encyclopedia of natural healing and uh, it had a lot of great stories in it so the the package itself was a very story based package how Jim you know had cancer and destroyed every tumor in his body how this how Sally had high blood pressure and lowered it from this to this uh, yeah I immediately want to know the answers to those but go on right okay. <laughs> and one of the things that that I came up with was to to put and it's been used a lot since then it was probably used a little bit before i started doing it and i probably stole it from somewhere but it was a picture of these before and after arteries on the cover because the headline was melt away artery plaque right on the cover and so there was a picture of the arteries kind of not cut open it was an illustration so yeah. I, cut open is not really the i know term. what you mean it's kind of like you see a cross section of it yeah exactly and one of them was clean and f- had a little s- burst of light because it was so clean little starburst of sunlight right. and the other one was like all clogged up and the and and the people at boardroom looked at that and probably rightfully so looked at that said, oh that's gross you can't show that that's gross no one's gonna you know no one's going to respond to that except with revulsion and <laughs> uh but to their credit because that's how boardroom is to their credit they tested it they anyway trusted, yeah and it yeah it worked great people really People really responded to it. So, so what? Now, what did I clean the arteries? Oh remember? gosh, I can't even remember. It might have You're been supposed to remember, so you do it. it I can never remember. It, it, Fifteen minutes after I did, the day after I've written the bullet, I don't remember what the <laughs> what the answer was. But you know, there's so much that you know. Chelation, for instance, is is really helpful to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the uh, diets where you're really uh, being careful about eating a lot of oils and things like that. Yeah. Your typical uh, stuff. Natural raw foods type diets. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask about the campaigns that didn't work, but I I just still need to ask another successful one. Okay. I, you, you got me going on this. So the artery one is a great one. Uh, what's another one from Boardroom or, or some other place? Oh, gosh. Um I told you about the uh, estate planning one, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, there's the the one that I just. Of course, I always have the best memory of the one I just completed. Okay, and I, I, that is just being finalized. I don't know if it's successful yet, but I feel like it's successful, okay. and that was the. And I th- I think it's a good learning lesson too. That was the book I was telling you about. That's a very. Uh, comprehensive book on herbs very detailed for each herb there's what it does where it comes from studies that show what it does what it doesn't do precautions uh but it's very very dry when you really start reading it it's very very dry stuff and so to promote it i was kind of at a little bit of a loss because there's no stories or anything and so i really had to as it were dig into my bag of tricks and say and and also kind of research these different herbs and find stories on them right and find okay what's new in this where's the newness in this in this herb being used in a certain way um where do you find these stories well thank goodness you can you can google things now yeah. on the internet and find you know miracle cure, miracle cures uh, right. For oregano oil or something like that, and you, you got to search through a lot of junk, but eventually yeah. you'll find someone writing about about it in a credible way. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you know that's one way. You, the other way is to go to the do- if you're working on a promotion for a client, you know you go to the client and you you say, hey, where are your stories of your right. of your patients? Where are your success stories from what you've done? How do you know when any, to, Go ahead. I was just going to say, they don't have any. Tell them, go get some. You know, call. <laughs> send an email to everyone and say, hey, I'll pay you $10 if I use your story or whatever. That's probably illegal now with all these laws right. about what you can and can't do with testimonials. Yeah. So 
I was going to ask this, David. This is, this is interesting. How do you know? Because I'm sure someone can go on Google and find tons of like miracle cure stories. How do you know how far to push the envelope before you, it's like too much of like a miracle cure type of writing? Well, you know, it's like a spice. A little bit goes a long way. You just want to give enough where someone goes, okay, I I see people have used this and have had success with it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can too. Yeah. Uh, you're right, though. It's easy to overdo it. It's easy to hype it too much. Sometimes you don't want to be so over the top. Sometimes you want to say, look, this doesn't work for everyone. It works for 70% of the people who use it. And not only is that more true and you can sleep better at night, but it becomes more believable to people. They're, they're more trusting of what you say. Yeah. Whereas if you say this will work for you, uh, this works for anyone, then well, they know that's not quite true. Nothing works for everyone, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So what about a campaign that didn't work? And when you did postmortem, why? Not that your campaigns don't work or ones you've not heard of. Not that my campaigns <laughs> right. don't work. You know, I've been lucky enough with Boardroom where when stuff hasn't worked, we've had the opportunity to go back and, and redo it uh, and try again. They've been nice enough to let me try again. And a lot of times, I would say most of the time, it's kind of been because it was overly intellectual. It was like this intellectually seems like a very good idea to say these things and to cram in a lot of stuff. I, the first thing we did for Null didn't work. And it was very, there was all this type on the on the cover. Um, and it was all these intellectual bullets and reasons why. And the next thing we did was, after that, I did the melt away artery plaque and the big pictures of the arteries and the stories of the people rather than all this admittedly pretty cool stuff about what it could do yeah but if it doesn't have that emotional connection then if it doesn't get people involved on an emotional level then that's that's when i found people what it found it doesn't work yeah that makes sense were there any other pictures or stories you found that really hit an emotional connection with the you know obviously that made people act like the artery one is there something similar you know, I, I, as I say, I worked a lot with Jim Rutz, so I really have to give him credit for, um, for this because it's his thing. And that was, he did a, a package for Bottom Line Personal. And he had, it was for, he wanted to talk, remember when, I don't know if you remember back when Hillary Clinton was kind of implicated in this uh, cattle trading scheme, cattle futures. She got in trouble because uh, some broker she knew, someone she was connected with politically, said you really should buy cattle futures and she did and she made a lot of money. And Jim wanted to kind of talk about that and how you too can kind of beat the system. She beat the system, but you don't have to be the she you don't have to be Hillary Clinton to beat the system. And so he says, what I'm going to do, Dave, I'm going to put a picture of Hillary, because it was for cattle futures, I'm going to put a picture of Hillary milking the cow, you know, like milking the system. And she's like, and I saw the picture, it's like this big, a big cartoon cow, and Hillary is milking it, and the udder is being stretched out, and it was just the silliest thing you ever saw. And I'm like, Jim, Jim, I, I, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, but this, this, just, this is just silly, you can't do this, and this isn't going to work. And of course, it did work, and... I'll never forget bringing it. I wanted to make a copy of it once for something and uh, to use it in a uh, presentation that I was teaching thing or something. And I brought it into the quick copy thing to make a copy and I gave it to the woman to copy. And she looks at it and she goes, oh, wow, that's so interesting. <laughs> and what an experience it was to see the power of that kind of stopper in action. So a lot of times, and Jim Rutz is just especially good at this, this really incongruous, surprising stopper of a picture can really just have such a, a powerful effect on, on, on people. Yeah, that would stop people in their tracks for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so David, what about some of your um, all-time favorite headlines? Do any stick out to you? 
Are you talking of mine or of of yours just in or general? In general and yours. Gosh, again, it's hard to you know that they had, everything just sort of goes out of my head after it's done. Uh, that's probably one reason why I have to be so creative is I don't like remember. Okay, oh, this headline worked. Maybe I could apply it here. Um, but you know, certainly the uh, how to keep it, how how to how to cure any disease by finding its hidden weakness, uh, the melt away artery plaque. Um, you know, my best, some of my best creative ideas have been, have been, a, was a book, to, one of them was a book title. My friend Joe Vitale uh, sent me an email one day and he said, Dave, I just wrote this book about uh, P.T. Barnum. And uh, it's about like the marketing secrets of P.T. Barnum and I need a title. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I, I, this is just, it's such a lot of work to come up with a title for something like that. I, I, and so I, I thought about it. It's one of those things where you know how things just come to you. And what came to me was instead of there's a sucker born every minute, which P.T. Barnum is credited for, there's a customer born every minute just to turn it into the marketing thing. And that's what he titled the book with. And, you know, the book became a great a great success, probably not due to my title necessarily, but it helps. It helps. It, it, it did help. That did help. What are some things, obviously, you know, you're working with clients and sometimes, like you said, you're advising certain things and like some things may seem outlandish or they may not want to use it. What do you advise clients against that sometimes they, they don't listen? Well, first of all, let me say when, when things make clients a little bit uneasy, I love that because that means it's going to have an impact in the market. That means there's a little bit of edginess to it. That means it's not the same old, same old. Right. So I, I like when things make clients a little bit uncomfortable. Um, in terms of what clients don't listen to. Right. Um, or maybe they always listen to you. I don't know. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah they're pretty good about listening. For the most part, I think the biggest problem with clients is that they're so close to the product mm -hmm. and they get caught up in the product rather than the market and they get caught up in what's possible or what's not possible and don't, uh, don't kind of explore beyond the boundaries of things. Yeah. And sometimes you have to do that. You almost have to kind of fantasize and say, you know, why don't we tell people they can cure any disease? Why don't we tell them they can cure any disease by finding its hidden weakness? And let's make that work. And we found a way to make that work. Yeah. What about, what's, um, David, a question that's important to address about copywriting and direct response, but it may be often overlooked? A question that's important to address that's overlooked. Yeah. About like, because I'm sure you get a lot of questions from young copywriters or people or even the businesses that you are writing copy for um, that you come up with a different angle or mm -hmm. something else. What's often overlooked when people are, you know, actually writing copy or doing direct response? I think the biggest thing people overlook is to look at things from the prospect from the reader's point of view. Mm -hmm. And that sounds kind of obvious. You should always look at things from the prospect or reader's point of view. But really to do that, to really kind of put yourself in that, that third person head and, and look at the copy as if you are the prospect, kind of a method acting kind of thing. And just you, sometimes you have to spend five minutes just sort of putting yourself in that state. And then you look at it. It's really so clear what, what, the copy should be or shouldn't be it's especially clear what it shouldn't be and like when what tell me about that because you probably have that moment where it's it becomes clear what was one of those times that maybe you had it wasn't quite in the customer's voice and what you changed it to i wouldn't say it's not quite in the, yeah okay I, I see what you're saying in the customer's voice Because I'm sure I'm doing this and other people are doing this. They don't even realize it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think of an, you know, 
very it's hard for things to come in mind. Sometimes the just the conversationalness of it. I always think of better examples of not my own stuff. Yeah. But you know that wonderful book title. You know you could where you could have a they they had a book about um, relationships and women in relationships and why men sometimes don't. Uh, aren't very good at relationships and why they're sometimes not attracted to you and how to get them to be attracted to you. And you could come up with about like 10 reasons to get men to be more attracted to you or why men are such, you know, why men do things or whatever. Um, but the, the title they came up with was he's just not that into you. And it was just such a conversational grabber. It's like, you know, every woman just said, yeah, I've experienced that. I, I know that feeling. I want that book, you know? And it's the same thing with headlines. It should be something that you can say to the person next to you, you know, next to you in a bar or, you know, in, in bed with your wife at night where, you know, you just say, honey, look at this. Look at this. You can cure any disease by finding its hidden weakness. This is so cool. Um, whereas other headlines you would read and you would just feel silly saying, saying that to someone to someone next to you right you know 10 killer ways to you know beat disease out of your body forever you wouldn't you wouldn't say look honey 10 ways to killer ways to beat disease out of your body forever <laughs> and yet that's how people write sometimes you know they feel like oh if i use the word killer if i talk about beating it out of your body if i i've got to hype it up a little bit yeah yeah so if it's more of a conversational tone that you would say to someone else um, that could be an interesting and not like hype it up so much. Right. Because right. if you hype it up, it sounds like, it sounds like advertising. It sounds like these promotional things sound yeah. like. David, what, um, it sounds like a smooth road. Were there any roadblocks that you hit with copy or clients or in the copywriting journey that you learned from? You know, the biggest, I think, challenge for me has been and probably continues to be uh, to be my own editor or to be my own looking at it like we talked about from the prospect's point of view to, to you know, so many times I'll give my copy to someone and they'll go, you know, this, this part here is boring or this isn't very compelling or this is like this. I don't believe this. And I go, of course, I, I would have seen that if I would have just shifted perspective a little bit. And mm -hmm. so I think that's the biggest challenge. I think for probably for all writers is to just be able to do that more and more yourself, to know when it's not believable, to yeah. know when it's not as strong as it needs to be. Yeah. I want you to throw modesty out the window for a second and tell me... <laughs> um, why, what makes you an A-list copywriter? What's your superpower with copywriting? Because I just hear that you are David Deutsch, and A-list copywriter, A-list copywriter. So, so, <laughs> so tell me. There's always a chance that that's just good self-promotion. <laughs> it and, wasn't uh, you. It was other people <laughs> saying that, actually. So. Well, that's the essence of self-promotion is you get other people to say things. <laughs> so. uh, you know, my, a lot of my strength has to do with where I come from. Uh, I come from a very diverse background. I come from an advertising background. I come from an Ogilvy and Mather, which was a very high class. You, you know, we do very literate kinds of advertising. So, and I worked for a lot of different clients at Ogilvy and at ad agencies. And I worked for a lot of different clients when I went into a direct response. So... I have a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of being able to write for different clients, in terms of mm -hmm. being able to write for different types of products, different situations, different markets. A lot of writers, I find, are very good within a, a, a niche. They're good at writing this kind of promotion, or they're good at writing to this market. Mm -hmm. Or they're good at writing, you know, like you see internet writers who can sell internet marketing products and things like that. Um, and sometimes they're good at writing 
for this particular product, only to this particular niche for this particular product, and just have trouble kind of going outside that. Um, and when I'm coaching, I do a lot of coaching yeah. and a lot of creative directing, and that's that's something that I you know I help people with is to see that, hey, this stuff that worked here when you're writing about to, to internet marketers and talking about killer this and killer that and and this hyperbole doesn't work when you're talking in this market yeah. where you you create resistance with that very readily so what else makes you an a-list copywriter because i'm sure there's people with that experience who are not a-list copywriters who people who came from advertising yeah. background and they've written for all different types of things so i'm wondering what what it is what's the secret sauce <laughs> I wish it was easily as a secret sauce. It's, <laughs> That's the title of your new book. On. But you know, a lot of it is I'm a good writer. I'm really good at like putting words together. Mm -hmm. um, and so that at some time that a lot of the times is a really big help when combined with good salesmanship type stuff. The, interestingly, there are people that are as good copywriters as, as I am that aren't as good writers but they're much they're very good at the selling aspect of it mm -hmm. so you may not look at their copy and go wow that's very clever how they put those words together and that's that's clever how he says that you wouldn't think that looking at it you wouldn't say this is great writing but you but you read it and you go wow he pushed he knew just what buttons to push he put them and he pushed them in exactly the right way mm -hmm. yeah so those are two things i think that you you need as a copywriter and different copywriters have them yeah. to different degrees, is being good at putting words together, but also being good at knowing what to say, not just how to say it. So from some so, of your students, what are some of the big mistakes? You do a lot of coaching. What are some of the big mistakes you see them making? You mentioned one with uh, just going over the top with certain things. What else? What other mistakes well, are people making? As we talked about, which is, relates to what you said, just not looking at things from the perspective of the, of the prospect. I mean, I'm very lazy. I don't, I don't want to have to tell them things that they could tell if they looked at it from the, pros, from the, from the perspective of the, of the consumer or mm -hmm. if they gave it to someone to read and you know, got feedback from them. I'd rather mm -hmm. that was taken care of and yeah. I would take it to the next level. So it's really a lot of things like that can be answered I, in that way. But I think a lot of it, too, is, is some of the basics of believability and credibility and proof are lacking, that there's not a constant concern with what am I doing here to keep the belief of this prospect? How am I reinforcing credibility and believability how do I reinforce? How do I prove what I just said mm -hmm. is true? Because if you do that for like everything you say, then there starts to be this building and building of, of believability and convincing. So I think it's that kind of just care of, of making sure that what you say is believable, said in a believable way, not mm -hmm. just, you know, a lot of people I think write on automatic pilot they know how this sort of thing sounds and they make it sound like this sort of thing sounds rather than really thinking about what's going on. And we're getting back to what I said before. Let's kind of went in a circle rather than thinking of thinking about, okay, what is the prospect thinking at this point and how do I answer that? They're probably thinking uh, they're a little skeptical. They're probably wondering how, if this is true, how could this also be true? So then at that point you want to be writing you may be wondering how, if this is true, this right. could also be true. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, it's because blah, blah, blah. You have to get inside the, their mind of how they're thinking as they're reading. Yeah. 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 What's been, David, one of the proudest accomplishments as a copywriter? It's, I think, all those, those things of, of taking a, a really good book on herbs and, and making it... Um, making it something that people will buy and benefit from taking a book on estate planning that people really need to get and making it so it's interesting and people will buy it and do the estate planning that they need to do um 
a lot of times it's it's been filling seats in a seminar that's a really good seminar that people should go to helping people build their their product or their business um i think those kinds of things even just helping joe vitale with his book title you know that was a nice feel. every time i go in a bookstore and i see that title i feel a sense of i right. feel a sense of accomplishment for yeah. that um when i see my packages for boardroom in the mail you know there's a nice feeling of accomplishment that that's being that that's being mailed out yeah who are some of your mentors or colleagues who when you want another set of eyes looking at your copy who do you turn to uh john carlton uh paris lampropolis um and uh there's a, uh, a a writer that that I work with, which is who is fast becoming an A-list copywriter, Marcella Allison. Uh, and a lot of times we'll we'll work together on things and we'll trade critiques on things. And uh, those are the when you, those are the people I've, I also Jim Punkry, who I worked with uh, for a time and is still kind enough to now that he has his own publishing company, he's still kind enough to to read what I've written and comment on it. And that's, that's always ego deflating and eye opening at the same time. <laughs> Tell me know? about the ego deflating part. You know, it's ego deflating in the sense that you, he'll point out things that I've missed that I should have seen. Mm. Um, but that's kind of why you went to him, right? And that, yes, but still I, really much rather he says this is perfect and <laughs> yeah. you should just mail this as it is it's almost not it's almost not he was explaining this to someone the other day it's almost not the it's not just the ego deflating that's almost like not too bad it's the oh i thought i was done with this and now i'm not done you know yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what's some of the best advice john and paris have given you Gosh, you know, everyone that I've worked with or that I know or great, great copywriters that I've studied, they all have these amazing strengths. And Paris's strength is he's such a student of copywriting and he knows so well what works, what doesn't, in what circumstances it works, in what circumstances it doesn't. He knows that if you want to do A to this market, then you can either do this, this, or this. And if you do this, you need to do it in this way rather than this way. So he's just got such a great understanding of copywriting and, and ability to look at copywriting and dissect it. And again, know what works, what doesn't. Carlton, it just has this tremendous ability to... Just get to a next level with writing, to a, this level of from from this course is a very good course on how to be a better golfer. It will teach you how to shoot putts with great accuracy. It will teach you how to drive 300, 400, 500 yards or more. If you get this course, it will be, and he'll just take it, for, you know, and he'll just, I'll get him on the phone and he'll be like, like, look, what you want to say is this, you want to beat your buddies at golf. This is what you need to do. You need to get this course because this is, and he'll, he'll just know that emotional trigger is that these golfers, they don't really want to hit 500 yard drives. They don't really want to be more accurate. What they really want to do is beat their buddies at golf. And he'll immediately zero in on that yeah, yeah. and go into this five minute ra rant about what this product <laughs> will do for that. That if you could just get it down, if you could type quickly enough, that's, that's what, you, that w what needs to be the basis yeah. of what you do. So that's what I really learned from John is you got to be able to do that five-minute rant. You've got to yeah. be able to really know what the buttons are for your product. You've got to be mm -hmm. able to talk. If you can't talk the copy in five minutes, if you can't sell someone this book in five minutes, you can't write the copy. If you're not ready to write the copy mm -hmm. for it. So what would they say about you? When they come to you, what would they say? 
about your advice? They would probably say Deutsch is really able to see what's missing in my copy. If I've left something out, um, he'll be able to see that this isn't this isn't right. This doesn't ring true. This doesn't have the credibility. I'm not working up to my full potential here. And he'll give me some really good ideas on how to begin to fix it. He'll give me that push I need. He'll see that it's just not not working. Mm -hmm. Is there some uh, instance lately that you remember what was missing from someone that you've looked at re uh, recently? You know, a lot of the 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 stuff that I look at from some from younger writers, a lot of times it'll be missing specifics. For instance, a lot of times they'll be very tease oriented, and sometimes that's because some of the writers that I work with work a lot in the investment area, and so sometimes with investments you have to be a little more teasy. There's not you can't you don't want to tell them what stock it is. You don't want to tell them exactly what the methodology is. And they, they need to see that the more you give away, the more real the product becomes to the, to the consumer, the more believability you have, mm -hmm. and that they will still go to you to get the product. Mm -hmm. even, and it, even though you've given away nine-tenths, maybe that one-tenth is what they really need to make it work. The other trick is you tell them, I think this is a Dan Kennedy thing, you tell them the what till the cows come home. Tell them all about the what, what it is, what it does, what this, what that. But you don't tell them the how, the exactly how to implement it. Mm -hmm. So then they still need to get the book, the report, the newsletter to do yeah. that. David, I appreciate your time. I have one last question. Um, and before I ask it, <laughs> I'm just laughing because you're like, in the very beginning, you're like, when I start repeating things or I give a real short answer, it's just end, end the interview. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you weren't short with me, but um, we've got a lot of good information. And the, the last question, before the last question, just tell people where they can find you. What are you working on recently? What are you excited about? Uh, they, where they can find me is www.davidldeutsch.com. That's D-A-V-I-D, L as in Lee, and then D-E-U-T-S-C-H.com. Unfortunately, daviddeutsch.com was taken by the great physicist. Uh, I don't know if you ever hear of David Deutsch, the physicist? No. Yeah. I've only heard of David Deutsch, the copywriter, there's a, there's not, a the, very not famous the physicist. There's a very famous physicist named David Deutsch um, who's written a bunch of books. He's not quite Stephen Hawkins, but he's, he's pretty well known. And um, so occasionally I'll get an email for him or I'll see a picture on the Internet of David Deutsch, famous physicist, and it's a picture of me or something like that, which is <laughs> always very flattering. Very nice. Um, so anyway, davidldeutsch.com. And, you know, basically what I'm still doing writing, uh, but I'm doing also a lot of creative directing. A lot of times people, companies will bring me in to work with their writers, whether they're in-house writers or outside writers, to kind of get the copy up to a, to a, to a more effective level. Uh, sometimes I work with writers individually. They'll come to me and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do a project for this big company and I really want it to be good. Can you kind of creative direct it? Can you, can you give me some coaching? Um, and... Uh, that's it. More and more I work with companies, too, in a kind of a partnership. Not so much like, we need copy, write us copy, give us copy, we pay you for copy. But more like, hey, we want someone to work with us kind of on an ongoing basis uh, with the marketing strategy and, and the copy that's a part of that strategy. And I like that. I like working with companies on that level. It's more of a longer term. You can it's kind of see longer. how it, it develops instead of just a one-shot deal. Right. Right, and of course, that's it's to the interest of the of the companies too, is to have someone working with you. That's kind of like, hey, we should test this now and test this, and let's try doing this, and let's try this whole different strategy. David, my last question is: since this is you know inspired insider, my question is about inspiration, obviously, and I want to know what you think about that motivates you when times get tough 
or you're just trying to break through, um, you're having like a writer's block. What do you think about? Well, in terms of writer's block, I don't really get writer's block. I just, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of a, of a cliche, but um, I'll just start writing. I'll write a different section. There's a lot of ways to overcome that. I, I, you know, people a lot of times say, what's a better way to do this? What's the best way to do a closing? Or what's the best way to do this? Or what's the best thing to do for this? There is no best. There's, there's, you can take anything and you can make it work. You can do it in this way and make it work or do it in this way and get, make it work. This way is not better. It's, it's you do this well or you do this well and it works. So a lot of times you just write a sentence and you can make that work and you can start from there and then you can go back and change that sentence if it wasn't the best sentence to begin with. Or you can just throw the whole thing out and start again. The important thing is just to, to keep writing. So that's why I don't really believe in writer's block. Yeah. And you can always just, a source with direct response, there's so much copy usually involved. There's always like an order form to write or some other, some other part to write. More the getting stuck is in kind of the, how do I solve this problem? How do I make this work? How do I sell a book that's, you know, doesn't have a lot of stories in it and is kind of dry? Yeah. Um, how do I sell a weight loss product when there's so much stuff out there yeah. about weight loss, making these outrageous claims? And that's where, you know, you, you just realize that you're going to have to put in a certain amount of hours to this is something I learned from Gary Halbert. It, it was in terms of mistakes. He said, you know, in order to be successful, you're going to have to make a hundred mistakes. So every time you make a mistake, just say, damn glad I made that. That's only 99 mistakes to go, you know? And the other thing is just start making the mistakes as quickly as possible. Yeah. And it's the same thing. I just start coming up with ideas, start coming up with solutions. And I know I have to come up with 90, you know, 99 until I get to 100 because the first 99 are going to sound like every other weight loss thing right. out there, you know, and finally at number 100, there's going to be something that's going to slip in under the radar. Yeah. I, th I, I think in general, I think people give up too easily. I think that's when you said something about working with writers and, and, and things like that. Um, I think people, who are successful. If you look at people who are successful, Jerry Steinfeld isn't necessarily a better comedian than a hundred other comedians that started out at the same time he did, but the 95 of those other comedians dropped out before they became successful. He just kept going and kept going and then finally he was successful. Right. And it's the same thing with writing and coming up with headlines. You know, People come to me and they say, okay, here, I, my headline for this piece. Well, it's not very good. How many headlines did you write? No, I just wrote this one. I, you know, it's what I came up with. <laughs> well, go write a hundred, and then, and so that's the way I think you get to answer your question. That's the way you keep going. Is you just yeah. you just keep going. You just say I'm going to write a hundred headlines. I'm going to keep going, and you you have a vision of this project completed, and the results of this project, and yeah. the client being happy, and you getting big checks. Yeah. You said something interesting before we hit record, which is you look at the future. Yeah, and that's something Gary Benzavenga um, was really uh, instrumental in, in kind of teaching me this, even though it, it comes from if you read the secret and all those sorts of things about, you know, envision what you want. Um, Gary just made it very practical and had a very practical way of doing it. He would talk about envisioning the check coming from the client, envisioning the client, congratulating him on the success of the piece. But you need to do that because copywriting is a long haul, you know, and it's a lonely long haul. Yeah. And if you're just focused on the immediacy of what you're doing, it can kind of get a little discouraging. If you're focused on down the road, yes, I'm going to come up with all these bad ideas and I'm going to go through frustrations, but I'm going to get to that good part where the client is very happy that their product is selling and they're sending me nice checks. That's a good feeling. Yeah. David, I want to be the first one to thank you. It's been an absolute pre pleasure. Thanks for joining me. The A-list copywriter. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's been great to talk to you. <laughs>